Are there marketing tasks that need to be done for your company, but you just don't have the time or enough people to help? Do you hate managing social media? Are you curious about starting a podcast? This episode is hosted by the founder of GetLeverage.com, Nick Sonnenberg. Leverage is a premier marketing platform that pairs you with a team of experts for any big or small project that you want to outsource. Hey guys, Nick Sonnenberg here, and this week's episode is actually a talk that I gave at my good friend Giovanni's Archangel Scale event in Toronto. It was an awesome event. We're speaking about the future of work, how to scale organizations, technology, tools, systems, optimizations to help prepare you and your company to not just survive over the next three to five years, but to thrive. So hope you enjoy. With this song, you can always tell in the audience those that have kids and those that don't. The ones that don't have kids, are, you're all doing the baby shark thing. And the ones that do, are like, how the hell did this song even find me here? <laughs> um, but the title of my talk has come up for air. I have a, I have a new book coming out. I'll, I'll be sharing the, the core concepts of the book. But I first want to start by thanking Gio. Um, let's give Gio a quick round of applause, guys. He always throws the best events. Um, I'm honored to be a speaker here. I'm really excited to learn from other speakers. So fair warning, this is not going to be the sexiest talk. And you, got, you just got that warning from Pam, but I just want to give you another warning. So I'm not going to be sharing with you the million dollar funnel, how to get a billion followers on Instagram. That's all really important stuff. But the stuff I'm going to be sharing with you is critical for you to not just survive over the next three years, but to, to thrive. I'd like to start off and have you uh, imagine that you're going to go for a race. What would you want? What kind of car? Well, most people would want a fast car, right? And when we're talking about scaling, we're always just thinking about going fast. But what if the racetrack has speed bumps, or spikes, or broken trees, or tornadoes, or Godzilla, or Godzilla spitting fire, or worse, you know, all these banana peels all of a sudden come out? You know, wouldn't you be better off with this, a less fast car, but without all those obstacles? So the way that I think about scaling is that there's really only two things that you have to be thinking about. How to go faster and how to avoid going backwards. And it's kind of, I, I kind of stole a little bit of inspiration from Dean Jackson. He has this whole now, not now concept. So when I was thinking about scaling, it's really that simple. Um, and uh, I picked Baby Shark not to get stuck in your head all day, even though part of it was. But the book um, that I have coming out is called Come Up for Error. It's all about team efficiency and how you can leverage systems and tools to maximize your team's productivity. There's a lot of new tools out there. We'll be sharing some of them today. This is my second book. My first book was called Idea to Execution. Um, it's the story of how I scaled my company leverage, which Gio just mentioned. Um, how I scaled it to seven figures in the first year, 150 people, no office, uh, never raised money. Um, a lot of problems with that, which I'll go over. But um, who here has written a book or is thinking about writing a book? Okay, so you guys will appreciate this story. The way that I wrote the book is actually quite interesting. Um, I only spent about 25 hours on the book. I, did, it, did you guys spend a bit more than that? So the way that I wrote the book was there's an app called Dropvox with a V. And every day I would brain dump ideas of what I did that day or um, smart and dumb things that we did. This app connected to a Dropbox folder with a B. And then I set up an automation that whenever a new audio file got added to this folder, it would send the audio file to an editor at Leverage who would listen to it, summarize it, and put it into an Evernote. After about nine months or so, this Evernote was basically a book. We then um, collaborated with Tucker Max's company, Scribe, did a sequence of interviews over three months. And then um, after three months, I had a rough draft. I still didn't read the book. I uh, announced on my podcast who would like to be a beta reader in exchange for giving notes. So I stuck it in a Google Doc in suggestion mode. 12 people raised their hand, so I crowdsourced the editing. And then I gave it a read. And um, 
a month later, uh, I had a book. And it wasn't a New York Times best-selling book, but um, it got fourth on Forbes in 2017 for top uh, entrepreneur books. And um, who knows if I would have spent 26 or 30 hours, you know, maybe it would have done even better. Um, so just to give you a quick background on myself, um, I have always been obsessed with saving time and efficiency. Um, you can see a baby picture of me, a picture with my mom. So even as a young kid, you know, I have this mother, she's, she's British, she has this accent, she's flowery. It's every kid's dream to have like a real life Mary Poppins. And, you know, I would, I would be sitting there getting bedtime stories saying, can you just get to the chase? So it, she wore a red dress and got eaten by a wolf. I get it. But what my mom did teach me at a young age was outsourcing and the power of outsourcing. You see, I had her write all of my college essays. And that helped me get into Santa Barbara, where I continued on this journey of efficiency. And um, the first week at Santa Barbara, I mapped out like the most efficient way to knock out the most courses. I ended up graduating in three years instead of four. And I spent my fourth year doing a master's in financial engineering at Berkeley. And at Berkeley, I'm nowhere near the smartest person there. I'm actually the youngest that they ever took. And there's half of them have PhDs. There's rocket scientists. Um, but I end up applying kind of the same principles that I've always applied, and I end up getting top of the class, not because I'm a genius, there's plenty of people way smarter than me, but it's because I f I'm, I'm good at finding the most efficient way to do things. Um, I, went, I went on to become a high-frequency trader, and this story kind of resonates a lot with what Gio mentioned about getting to the top of a, of a mountain, it was just the wrong mountain. Um, by 26, I'm making seven figures, living in a top floor of the Four Seasons. Um, I've made $70 million for uh, the bank that I worked for with algorithms that I was building. Basically, if you don't know what a high-frequency trader is, I'm building algorithms, algorithms and developing mathematical models to trade stocks at microsecond speeds. So I'm programmed to be thinking in terms of automation, to be thinking in terms of how can I shave off a microsecond. And it's not just uh, with the stock market. I was creating programs because I'm also lazy, as Geo, another thing we have in common. So I would create scripts so I could get into the office later and later, and eventually, like 10 minutes before the open, I could go and click a button, and all the different programs would pop up on my 16 computer screens. Um, and so I had this awesome job making more money than uh, I ever thought, living in Hong Kong. I'm four inches taller than anyone else there, which was another benefit of that. But, but. I'm, I was at the top of the wrong mountain. And what I'm most proud of is not, you know, what I accomplished in school or, or, or making the money. It was breaking from the golden handcuffs because it's really tough when you're making that kind of money to, to give it up. So I give up 85% of what I'm making because ultimately what I want is freedom. And I wasn't happy in Hong Kong. So I decide to, to give it up and I go back to New York. And while in New York, I do a trip to the Turks and Caicos with a group of friends. And my friend Aaron is having a pina colada by the pool with his laptop. And at this point, I don't even know what an entrepreneur is. I'm like, all right, you're unemployed. Um, <laughs> but at, he explained it to me. And at that moment, I realized I didn't have the coolest job. You know, I'm, I'm managing $10 billion. I have 16 computer screens. But what's the, whole, what's the point if you don't have freedom? Right? Freedom to work on whatever you want, with whoever you want. I had a lot of freedom, but still, it wasn't enough. I wanted to have what he had. So long story short, I quit. I start my first company, Calvin. It's, uh, it was in the scheduling space, and it was to make planning more efficient. I had just broken up with an ex-girlfriend, and I was making a lot of plans. And being the engineer that I am, I wanted a more efficient way of doing that. And um, and through my experience with Calvin, I had to hire freelancers. And I used um, platforms like Upwork and Fiverr and Elance and Odesk and virtual assistants. And it was painful. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of people. You have no idea who's good and who's not good. Is this guy in Russia any better than this girl in the Philippines? 4.8 star versus 4.9, $35 an hour versus 55. So I experienced that firsthand. And if you fast forward six months, I'm, I'm getting dinner with my ex-business partner. 
and we're having dinner the day that one of these platforms um, announces they're going under. And we started brainstorming what did they do wrong, what's missing in the market, and what we kind of came to was, wouldn't it be awesome if you just had this like Navy SEAL team that could m do anything you needed, and instead of having to hire multiple different people on all these platforms, and then you're the project manager, and if you're not happy, you're fighting with some person in some other country, what if we just gave you this like agile team that, you, that people could use as much or as little as you wanted, and scale it up and scale it down and pay for what you need? And by the end of dinner, um, we had a concept, and I was like, look, I can build the tech in a day. You get five clients, and we'll launch on day two. And that's, that's what we did. That's how we started Leverage. Um, and uh, we scaled very fast, and there was a lot of problems with the way that we scaled, which I would like to share with you. But we, um, a month in, at first we were just the freelancers under fake names, so people were having great service for the first month because they, they got the two of us. Um, but a month in, uh, Joe Polish, the founder of Genius Network, has us give a talk at, at the annual event. Day two is uh, Tony Robbins, and day three is us. And all of a sudden, we go from like no business, and we get 90 out of 100 people to sign up. So we're like, all right, well, we have to figure this out. And um, yeah, the, from there, we, we grow super, super quick, and there's a lot of problems with that. I would like to do a, a quick exercise with you, though. I would like you guys to close your eyes just for a second, and I'd like you to imagine and think about the most important person in your company. It could be your CFO, your COO, your head of sales, marketing. I want you to imagine everything that this person does on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis. And now imagine that they ask you to talk in your office, and they tell you that they're leaving. How, how would that feel? What would, you, what would you do? And they're not just leaving. They're leaving in five minutes. You're not even getting two weeks. You, you can open your eyes. So on Tuesday, October 3rd, 2017, before I could even get a cup of coffee, this happened to me. Has anyone here experienced something like this before? A key person in your company leaving? Yeah, it kind of felt like this. And you have to also understand, you have to understand we didn't, we weren't well organized. We didn't hire Alex Sharfin, who's going to be speaking tomorrow. We weren't doing things like what Alex is going to teach you guys tomorrow, right? Our organizational chart was very simple. He was people facing and I was non-people facing. And then there was 150 people underneath us that did work. So. What, that, what does this mean? So he's handling hiring people, training, getting clients, and I'm handling all the tech, systems, automation, operations. So the, there's a few problems, it turns out, that this poses when that, when that happens. So one, my team had no idea who I was. So I just inherited 150 people, fully remote, and they literally don't know who I am. And if you don't believe me, there's an app a bot called Donut that we use, which is a Slack bot. It connects two people in Slack together. And literally, I'm like, how long have you been with the team? And they're like, oh, a few weeks. How about you? I'm like, well, I kind of started it, so it's been a little while now. <laughs> um, not to mention clients didn't know who I was. We lose 40% of revenue in Q4 2017. Um, people are leaving. Clients are leaving. Team members are leaving. Bank accounts are getting frozen. I'm cashing out 401ks to make payroll. I even find out as a nice bonus that uh, a few felons had gotten through that we had hired. So really, really fun time. And the only reason why we didn't go bankrupt and that we, we were holding on by a thread was because I had the foresight six months before to document all the core processes in the company. And I'm thankful that this happened because this experience forced me to develop this CPR framework, stands for Communicate, Plan, and Resource. And it, 
I didn't have a choice. It was for survival. We were bleeding very quickly. And so I quickly, without realizing that I had created this framework, later I realized, hey, this is a framework. And I've used it now with, um, on a consulting basis with two-person companies, um, that coaches, uh, agencies, up to Joe Polish, Jay Abraham, and Ethereum, 1,200-person company. And the framework has proven to work with companies of all sizes. The only, the only pattern is the smaller you are, the easier it is to implement not just CPR but any change. So the sooner you get things implemented in, in your company, especially with technology, the easier it is um, and the more scalable it is. Complexity scales exponentially with team size. So this is a great illustration of that. You can see if you're a three-person team, there's three different nodes. There's three ways to connect. And once you go to four, there's six. And if you look down here, 14 people, there's 91 different ways to connect. So it's absolutely critical that you have efficient processes and technology and ways that you guys operate. Because if you try to do it later when you're already 10 or 20 or 100 people, it's going to take a lot more effort to put it in. So an underlying principle and belief that I have is that a company can only scale as fast as knowledge can be transferred. So we're going to be getting into the CPR framework in a little bit. But the motivation behind it is that you want to avoid all the waste and inefficiencies in your company with having to look in multiple places to look from, for different information because you haven't established a framework inside. There's so many companies I've worked with where they operate basically completely off of text. And then if they have to go and look for information, it's like, was that in the text with Geo, with Geo and Stephanie, with Geo, Stephanie, and Andrew? Was that in text or was that in email? I don't remember. Which email thread was that in, right? And so that's what slows companies down. So that's the motivation is, and I'm going to lay out in the CPR framework, I give a recommendation in terms of how to think about the tools, when to use which types of tools, um, and how to optimize each of the tools. Okay. Now, I just want to switch gears for a second and just do a quick review of the history of what the office and work. So if you look here, this is kind of in the 1920s. It's an open office. People are physically located together with a typewriter, not looking too happy. It's probably a water cooler, you can imagine, like on the side where people will go and talk shit about you know, being under underpaid and overworked. If you fast forward 70 years, in the 90s, this is what the office looked like. It's pretty much the same, except you've upgraded the typewriter to a computer, but people are still physically in person. They can walk over, tell something to someone, and if, they're, if they want to talk shit, they still go to that water cooler and they go and bitch about being underworked, uh, uh, underpaid and overworked. So fast forward, so that's 70 years that that happened. You know, fast forward about 10 years, this is what my office used to look like. And now if you scroll to today, this is the future of what, of what work is. The only thing missing here is the pina colada for this guy. But everything else, this is the future. And if you're not set up, not to, I'm not saying you have to be remote. But if you aren't set up so that you can work with remote people, you're going to be in trouble. Because if this is the radius that you're limited to for hiring people, and your competitor's radius is this, who do you think is going to win? Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but there's, there's a ton of metrics around. By next year alone, 50% of employees will be able to work remotely. There's a, there's a bunch more research you can look up. But this stuff, whether you like it or not, it's coming. And if you aren't set up to work with remote teams, you're going to be really, really far behind. And the technology in the CPR framework is critical to facilitate that because you don't have the benefit of walking down that office to, to, tell, to tell a colleague something. Nobody likes commuting. No one likes this. This, this is stressful. And part of the reason why the future of work is going to be more and more remote is all things being equal, if people that are working for you can make the same amount of money, not sit in that for an hour each way, 
right? And be able to go to Bali in the winter time or leave Toronto in the winter time and go to South America. If they can make the same amount of money, what do you think they're going to pick? You're going to have retention problems if you can't support that kind of culture. And uh, we have living proof. Andrew in the audience, I make fun of him, I call him Forrest Gump because that's him walking on the, on the left. So Andrew, a year ago, was making six figures in a, in a job and he was the guy in the, in the traffic. And we were able to match his compensation. He now saves two hours a day not going in, in uh, traffic. He really is thinking about going to Bali in February. He walks seven miles a day on a walking treadmill. That's his, that's his office. So his quality of life has gone up tremendously, making the same amount of money. And that's going to become more and more of a trend. There's a new category of business um, out there. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but it's called business process outsourcing. And nowadays, it's not just leverage. You can outsource entire departments. You can outsource your sales department, your client success department. There's companies like Task Us. There's leverage. There's virtual assistant companies. So you can literally outsource an entire department. Um, I've had a bit of experience with outsourcing, running an outsourcing company. So here's an example of a real life task that we had. So one tip is try to put your, when you're outsourcing to any company, try to put your um, head in the mind of the person. So book me a flight is not the most descriptive way of, of describing what you want. You know, like when and where is helpful in that case. Um, so some tips with whatever company you use to outsource. You, these are just some guidelines, but you should say when you need something by, how much time and money you're expecting. And if you can, what I find to be helpful is try, and this is not just outsourcing, this can even be used, just delegation in general, if you're doing this with your team. Try to explain what success looks like and the why, so that people can fill in the gaps, because it's usually impossible to, to fill in every single minor detail to someone. But usually the success looks like and the why is, a, is helpful. And it's not just about what to outsource, but think about, be creative and think about how to outsource. So for instance, I write for Inc. Magazine. I don't actually write any of my articles. What my process is, is I take time that's low productive time, like when I'm in Uber or I'm walking. I'll audio record some content. And I'll send that to my, my ghostwriter at Leverage, who will listen to it and write an ink article, coordinate with the team to post it. I've even gotten lazier than that. And now I just introduce Aiden to someone, and I just tell them to figure it out. But my point is that how, like how you process is just, how you outsource is just as important. Because there's the whole concept return on investment. But I like to think about return on time. So when you're, when you're outsourcing something, if you think about it, I spend maybe 30 seconds or a minute, and I get as an output something that would have taken hours. So the ratio is quite high. So things that I don't recommend or I personally don't outsource would be like a dinner reservation or those types of things. Because by the time you explain it to someone, you spend a minute explaining and it would have taken you a minute. So like that return on time is not very high. And another thing that most people don't consider is they're just looking at hourly rate. You should think about the total cost when you're doing these things. So, so when I say total cost, if it takes a $40 an hour person three hours, that's a total cost of 120. If you pay someone $80 an hour and it takes one hour, that's a total cost of 80. So it's not that the $80 an hour person is more expensive, they're actually cheaper. But that's kind of obvious. But what people don't really think about is, what's your time worth? If your time is worth $100 an hour, and it takes you 30 minutes to hold the hand of the $40 an hour person, right? if you do the math, that costs you $50 of your time and $40 of the other person's time. So that's $90 of total cost. So just consider that when you are delegating or outsourcing. Um, some examples of things that we have outsourced we have literally shipped breast milk to Mexico twice. Random. Um, I was on a TV show this year, Rhymes with Baby Shark. I outsourced the pitch. 
Um, I outsource all of my ink articles. You can outsource website development, marketing. Even the slides of this presentation have been outsourced. And outsourcing is just one tool, but if you can automate something, it's even better. Because a bot's not going to complain, go on holiday, ask for a raise. And in my consulting experience, I'm even seeing companies put employee IDs now on bots. That's how important bots are becoming. And automation, if you read my book, Idea to Execution, automation is, is, is core to that whole book. That's how I was able to bootstrap leverage without raising money, because instead of paying people to do things, we had a bunch of automations doing the processes. Um, Dan Sullivan has a few, he has many concepts, but there's a few that I just wanted to bring up. There's who, not how. So even at this type of event, you're going to be listening and hearing a lot of ideas. You don't need to know how to implement every idea you hear here. You just need to know the who to do it. And another really great concept is the concept of unique ability. So I, in, in everything I do, both my consulting and leverage, I'm trying to have people free up their time so they could work on things that give them joy or things that tap into their unique ability. And typically, if a robot can do a job, it can do that process, it's probably not tapping into that person's unique ability, right? If you have to look in 10 different places to find information, that's probably not utilizing someone's unique ability. So that's the motivation um, and what CPR is trying to achieve. It stands for Communicate, Plan, and Resource. And the most important thing isn't to, isn't to focus so much on the tools, which we'll cover tools, but it's to understand conceptually what is a communication tool versus a project management tool versus documenting knowledge. Most companies don't have that clear separation and things start getting fragmented very quickly. So in communication, I recommend thinking about it in three different ways. You have text for personal, email for external, and then there's a tool called Slack, which is for internal team communication. Just show of hands, how many people here use Slack? Wow, a lot of you. So Slack is a great tool, but only if used properly, right? So if you have naming conventions for channels, having guidelines around when a channel should be private versus public, notification preferences, third-party integrations, so there's so much that Slack can do, and, and a lot of people complain about Slack because like, oh, it's just another place or it's noisy. With any of these tools, it's not the tool that's the problem, it's how you're using it. So email is one of these tools that has been around for 20 plus years, and most people think they're using email right, but pretty much no one's using it right. So the way to think about email is it's just an external to-do list that other people can add things to. And when you start thinking about it like that, it becomes easier to process. Most people think that they're at inbox zero, but really they're at unread zero, and that's not the same thing. So sorry to tell you, all you sitting there, oh, I'm great at email. The bold and unbold is not, not the same thing, because you're still looking and cognitively processing 10,000 messages. You have no idea what in that list of things you actually have to do right now or not. There's a big difference between really being at inbox zero, where you look in your six messages and that's your to-do list, versus 10,000. And I'm not going to have time to go too deep into any of these. I'm here for the next two days, so we can go over if you want. But um, I have a little acronym called RAD. It stands for Reply, Archive, Defer. So those are the three things you can do with an email. If you're using Gmail, it has built-in snoozing, which is the defer piece. So examples of deferring would be, say that there was directions to this event today that you got two weeks ago. Instead of you keeping that in your inbox for two weeks, you could have deferred it till the morning of today or yesterday when it's most relevant. Now, everyone wants to get to inbox zero, but the best way to get to inbox zero is to get to email zero. So a lot of the ways in which you're using email, for instance, internal communication, if you force your team to just use Slack for internal communication, that's one of the quickest ways to free up your inbox. So another benefit of having this separation, guys, is it allows you to prioritize how you run your day. So when I wake up in the morning, 
getting to Slack zero is my priority before text and email zero. Because if I unstuck my team and I remove their bottlenecks, that's how my company is going to move forward quicker. So before I reply to my, to my friends, to clients, Slack zero is my morning routine. Right? And if you don't have this separation, email and text is going to be this jumbled mix of all, this, all these conversations. So that's one. Slack becomes really powerful when you start looking at channels and the third party integrations. So they have this concept um, called a channel. And a channel is basically just one contained conversation or topic. So you could have marketing channel, finance channel, sales channel, which you can't do in text and email. And back to kind of that principle that I said earlier, a company can only scale as fast as information can be transferred. So it's way quicker if you want to find out the Facebook ads conversation you just had. You go to marketing hyphen Facebook. You want to go and refer to something about bookkeeping, you go to finance hyphen bookkeeping. Versus you could be talking with your bookkeeper about taxes, bookkeeping, payroll, and a bunch of things that's free form in text and email. Here you can create channels by topic so it's faster to find. And then it has this app store. And there's thousands of apps. One, one that most people like is the Giphy one. So you could do like slash Giphy, good job, or someone on the sales team like closes a deal. You could like do slash Giphy crushing it. And, some funny video pops up. But if you are starting to work more remotely, these are little things that actually are important because you want to maintain culture in your remote team. But there's thousands of other integrations. There's Stripe integration. So if a new person signs up, you can get notified into a new sign-up channel. If someone books a, a call with you, you could get notified in a new call channel. If a lead converts to an opportunity, that could go into a sales channel. Um, so if you use Slack properly, you can imagine it becomes this command center where you don't have to leave it and you could start getting all this information from a bunch of different systems. So I mean, I could have done a three hour talk just on Slack, but you know, for the sake of time, let's move on to the P for planning. Um, if you were to imagine we were gonna all go camping in the forest together, we would need walkie-talkies to communicate, and we would need a map to navigate out of the forest. So communication, what we just discussed, that's your walkie-talkie, but that's not your map, right? Project management software like Asana, Trello, Monday, that's your map. So that's where you want to capture the state of tasks and projects so you can hold yourself and your team accountable. If you make the mistake, of trying to project manage in Slack or text or email, things get lost, it causes frustration, it causes inefficiencies, and you don't know what to hold people accountable to. So use the right tool in the right context. Hacking a communication tool to assign tasks and manage projects is not the, the most optimal. Another tool within planning is I recommend that everyone should use an agenda for meetings. And I'm sure Alex Sharfin's going to talk more about this tomorrow. Um, but we have a rule at Leverage, no agenda, no meeting. We recommend a tool called Navigator, navigator.com. And an agenda tool is a really, it's a really important tool because what you can start, what you want to avoid uh, is you want to avoid Slack becoming noisy and distracting everyone so they're not achieving their flow state. We were just talking about flow state. An agenda is a great tool to help facilitate that because you should, what we do at Leverage is if anything is not urgent, we tell people add it to the agenda for next week's meeting and we'll batch answer and, and address it. So an agenda is a tool to help reduce the noise in your communication tools. Does that make sense? And the last part of CPR is resource, and that's documenting knowledge. And I have a separation between static and dynamic knowledge. So a wiki is where I put static knowledge. So you could think of it who, what, when, where, why. That's static. So what's the company vision? What are the core values? Where's the next uh, offsite? When are the town halls? That's all static. It's important to document, and that's in a wiki. 
and there's plenty of wiki tools, and we'll go over that. But then you have dynamic information, which is the how. So how do you do payroll? How do you do onboarding? How do you do offboarding? This is still something that you want to document, but you want to have a checklist alongside it. So you want to make sure that when you execute that process that you follow all the different steps in the process. And there's many, many benefits to this. If, if any of you ever read the book, The Checklist Manifesto, that was written by a surgeon. And they found that by putting checklists in surgical rooms, it cut down the risk of error by like over 80%. So both of these are critical. For wikis, here's just, here's just three that we've played around with. We currently use Ask Spoke. They all have pros and cons, but what I want for you guys is the main takeaway is you should use some form of wiki. It could even be a Word doc or Evernote. The main, the main thing is you want to have information and knowledge captured in your company so that when that moment comes and someone leaves, you're not stuck without, think, without knowing how to do payroll or what's the Wi-Fi password to the office. So we use, a, we use one called Ask Spoke. There's pros and cons. The pro of Ask Spoke is it has a bot that integrates with Slack. So instead of forcing someone to look through some knowledge base, the, you can ask the bot questions. So you can see here, uh, we asked the bot, what's the company vision? And the bot will go and look in the knowledge base and then return the article. So that's pretty cool. It's quicker than going and searching through some long document. Um, what also is cool with, with Ask Spoke, which is something that we're trying to make more of an effort with, with Leverage, is if it can't find the article, it'll create a support ticket. And a lot of scaling and the conversation with scaling, a lot of it is removing bottlenecks, right? You want to remove the bottlenecks. You want to remove the, the, the chance that if there's one critical point of failure in your company, you want to minimize that. So creating support tickets to ask questions rather than direct messages is something that we're currently rolling out. And the logic is that way, if you're, as you grow, if you're a 100 person company and your payroll person goes on vacation for a month, you don't want to explain to 100 people, hey, now Andrew's the backup person for Alice this month. But if you've trained everyone from the beginning to create support tickets internally, behind the scenes you can manage the triage and you don't have to explain to 100 people you know, what's going to happen while one person just quit or one person goes on vacation. Now, the only negative that I've seen with Ask Spoke is you have to know what to ask. So it's not quite the same as giving someone an employee manual. Most people don't know what to ask. So the solve for that is this other bot called GreetBot. So what GreetBot is, is when we hire people, we have a new hire channel, and GreetBot automatically sends a message to this new person. And the clever trick that we're doing is GreetBot will say, you know, hey, Nick, welcome to the team. Here's some stuff to look at. And by the way, here are 14 questions we would like you to know the answer to. Copy and paste it to the leverage bot. So that's a way, if you are looking to roll this out, we found that to be a really effective and efficient way to roll out this Ask Spoke tool. Because from the, from the gate, they're, they're reinforcing the concept of asking a bot question. And there's Notion, there's Confluence, there's a whole bunch of them with pros and cons. So that's the static information. Now let's talk about process. So there's a lot of benefits of documenting process. What we talked about de-risking the company. Another benefit, though, is you save time. So the tool I'm going to share with you is called Process Street. And Process Street is what I recommend for documenting processes. It integrates with Zapier, which is an automation tool. So you can imagine what I call process. You can see here the hiring process. There's multiple steps. There might be conditional logic. It could be, uh, if it's a developer, maybe, maybe step four is an interview, and the head of development is responsible for that step. 
you could have steps one through three be done in any order, but before you do the interview, you want to make sure that steps one through three are completed. But it integrates with Zapier, so you could start automating certain steps. So if part of your hiring process is to send you know, a congratulations email, or if it's a rejection, to send a rejection email, you can integrate this with Zapier, so on the send email step, you can just click a button, and that will send the email. We've integrated it with HelloSign, which is a contract, which is an online document signing tool. So when we're ready to send the contract, we click a button, it pre-fills the contract and sends it to them. When they sign the contract, that's, that triggers through Zapier a checklist to be created for the, net, for the next process. So it de-risks your company, it saves time, it helps, you, it helps you with consistency and reduces variability. And one trick that we do with, um, with Process Street, which I highly recommend, is we rotate positions quarterly. And the only way you can do that is if you, have doc if you have your processes documented. So from the days that I was a high frequency trader, um, I was forced to take a two week block leave every, every year, and that's to make sure I'm not hiding trades. So back then, we didn't have fancy tools like this, so you had to go old school, and you had to write an email to people, this is how I trade my book, this is how the algorithms work. And every year for eight years, even though I was the expert at that algorithm or that book, there was always an improvement to my process when I, when I came back. And, and that's because fresh eyes spark innovation. So even though we're really talking a lot about de-risking, when you start documenting processes, that's, the only, that's, that's a precursor to being able to do these rotations or having other people give insight. Because if it's just in people's head, it's really hard to have that conversation. So we've mentioned this before, but this is this automation tool, Zapier, that we talked about. Zapier.com, uh, you need it. Whatever industry you're in, you should be using it. Um, it integrates also with Slack, so when different things happen externally, you can automate messages to go into Slack. And a takeaway here that I want you guys to leave with is we've talked about Zapier, Process Street. The tools are going to change, that's for sure. Slack might not be the winner in 10 years from now. But the concepts should stay the same. A communication tool versus a planning tool versus documenting knowledge, that will remain. Internal versus external communication, that's going to remain. So understanding the concepts is what I want most for you. And also, a tool is only as good as how you use it. So I'm going to just show you some quick math and then open it up to QA. Um, but if you set any of these tools wrong, it could, be, it could add more harm to your company than good. So using the tool in the right context in the right way is critical, otherwise you probably shouldn't even mess with it. So when I was, I was consulting with a thousand person company, and this ties into Jennifer's talk, um, so they had these channels, because so they didn't set it up in a way where they had control over who could create channels. So they created, it's called a public channel, and there were all these bullshit things that they, bullshit channels, they would have like New York office or yoga, and a thousand people would be in these channels. Right? And for culture, they thought this is great. But for productivity, if you do the math, assume that each message takes 10 seconds to read. And I'm being conservative when I say this, but if you're in a flow state, it takes way more than a minute to get back in, but it makes the math easier. So just bear with me here. I'm not very good at math. So uh, it takes a minute, let's say, in total, each time you get pinged. Say that there's 60 of these a day. There was way more than that. right? So that's per person, that's an hour of, of productivity lost. If the average rate that you're paying people in your team is $50 an hour, if there, now this is extreme because there's 1,000 people in this company, but you can do the same if you're a 10 person company, just remove two zeros. It's still a big number. So $50 a day, 1,000 people, that's $50,000 a day because of just com complete waste of just distraction and taking people out of flow state. So that's 50,000 a day, 20 days, 
20 work days uh, a month. That was a million dollars a month that these people were losing just because of how they set up Slack. So if you're a 10-person company, knock off two zeros, it could be $10,000 a month. It's still a lot of money. It's complete waste that is unnecessary and avoidable. So I have a couple minutes for, for questions. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Leverage Podcast. Leverage is an on-demand outsourcing platform that helps small business owners and entrepreneurs scale their business. We have a team of experts that can help set up marketing sales funnels, email marketing, podcasts, social media, paid media, and much more. Grow your business overnight with a team of experts you can trust to deliver. Accomplish more. Visit getleverage.com.